Okay, welcome. Uh, so, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to take a look uh, and introduce motion in one dimension. Uh, and we're going to approach this uh, with an algebra um, framework as far as the level of math is concerned, so high school level. And here we go. So, the first thing we want to know, if we want to study motion, um, is we want to know how, what do we need to know in order to describe how something is moving? So uh, let's think about that for a little bit while I uh, quick point out another, another thing up here. We're doing this in one dimension, which we'll talk about in a moment. And our, our Greek derived name for motion and its study is kinematics, the, the kine, the K-I-N-E part there is always connected to motion, like kinetic or kinesthesiology for studying how the body moves um, and so on. Um, so we need to know things before we can say anything about movement. We need to know um, what we're comparing movement too. So we need to know something about position. Um, and so in order to know a thing's position, we need to have a spot, a location, a coordinate system even, that we consider to be stationary and fixed. We need what we call a uh, frame of reference. Or a reference frame. So, and our frame of reference is going to be basically uh, our coordinate system that is considered fixed and unmoving with time. And so that's going to include, like any coordinate system like you might have on a map, it's going to have an origin, some zero mark, that you're comparing all of your positions relative to. Um, so we could have, um, there's no like preferred reference frame, um, one of the things we've figured out. Um, so we could say, oh, our reference frame is just whatever the heck I decide it's going to be on this board, and uh, I'm going to call this position here zero, and you know, maybe I'm marking in units of whatever these are, maybe this is something like three, six, nine, I don't know, maybe those are inches, uh, or something, and this is like negative three, and so on. So that could be a reference frame right there, uh, extending off into infinity, but with saying that this spot here, whatever it is, it's always that location of zero. And if you want to know a position, then you um, go ahead and say, oh, it's over at the nine inches position. It's nine inches in the positive direction away from our origin of our fixed 
reference frame. Um, but it's, of course, this is not the only uh, coordinate system. Uh, you've got uh, ones that are um, more uh, long-term agreed upon, like, say, the um, latitude, longitude, zero points where the equator and the Greenwich Meridian cross um, could be a, a, a considered a fixed point. That could be your reference frame. Um, the center of the Earth, um, and then some uh, line that goes through the North Pole and some line that goes through um, that point where the Greenwich Meridian and Equator cross could define another frame of reference. Um, the center of the sun could be the origin that we're talking about, the center of the galaxy, the center of mass of our local groups of galaxies, um, or if we want to get a little less cosmic, something very simple like the threshold of the front door of your room. Um, and so you're so many feet into the room or so many feet out of the room. Uh, the, the zero mile marker on um, Interstate Highway 93. Uh, the, um, the start line uh, all around the track of you know, your school. Um, any of those could be like your origin or position. Um, so that's one thing we need, is we need this position. Um, we also, I mentioned in that definition of reference frame, time. We need time as well, and time's kind of weird. Um, so we also need time. And if you think about it, what is time? No, like, what is time? No, no, but really, no, what do we mean by time? It's like, it's the difference between now and now. What's that? Uh, it's, it's less well-defined than we might like, perhaps, but we could say that it's what happens when regularly repeated phenomena change from one thing, from uh, one occurrence to the next occurrence. It's some manner of clock ticks, the difference between one clock tick and the next, where a clock tick doesn't have to be a literal clock. It could be something like the vibrations of a wave of light from maximum to minimum value or something like that or the sorts of things we use in building atomic clocks, the vibrations uh, of a particular isotope of cesium, um, or something like that. Uh, or we could go old school, and we can base it on the rotations of the Earth, could be our clock tick, or revolutions about the sun. Um, so, but we do need time uh, to help describe our motion. And um, I'm going to use uh, some variable symbols here to represent these folks. So we'll use uh, T for time, and we'll use X for position. Um, we can sometimes use um, other symbols for position. Sometimes uh, folks like to use S. I'm using X because uh, or I'm working with like the standard Cartesian coordinate system uh, where you have um, like an x, y, and z set of coordinates. And the first one of these that we work with we'll call the x direction. And then for the moment, we won't complicate things by looking in the other directions. One of the things we like to do in physics in general is we like to work with models, mathematical or descriptive, simpler versions, simpler descriptions of the full reality. 
um, than what we could possibly know and describe. If we can work with a simple version, like pretending that all the motion is on one dimension, and that gives us the analysis and the predictions that we're comfortable with, that the level of precision that we're interested in, the level of precision that's effective for whatever we're up to, then that's all we might need to do for that particular situation. We don't need to add on the more complicated bits. And, but later on we may find, oh yes, it does matter whether thinking is going up and down and left and right. Uh, we can make things a little bit more complicated and add more layers on top and get closer and closer to the full real world or close enough that it works for what we need to do for predictions. So we have position in time here. And um, while we're looking at these things, we have another thing we want to take a look at. Um, and that is things that we measure um, we can classify into um, scratch that, I'll save that for a different one. So, we've got position and time, and we wanted to talk about motion. So, motion, we want to take a look at how do these things change with time? What does that mean? So, uh, first off, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to give us a definition. We're going to set, I'm going to define a term called displacement. And this is going to be the difference between a later and earlier position. And for symbols, I'm going to use um, the delta symbol. So delta is our Greek letter. So capital delta that looks like a basic equilateral triangle. It's the Greek equivalent of D. And we're going to use like delta for difference. Delta and in this case, displacement, but delta means the difference between one thing and another thing, between the final version minus the earlier version. So delta x, this is change in position, and that's like x final minus x original. I'm sticking arrows over these because direction matters. It matters if we're going in the negative direction or the positive direction. Later on, when we go in more to one dimensions, it matters whether we're going in the y direction or the z direction or the x direction or somewhere in between. Um, and so that's what this is. And we can look at so this is also this displacement here. I'll stick that up here for later. And the notation here, those subscripts, F for final, O for original, it could mean we could change around the subscripts. We could do like x1 minus x0, or x2 minus x1, or x final minus x initial. Um, for some reason in physics and mathematics we like to use we like to use sort of the British version of zero or and we like to say not. Uh, so x not. Uh, but there we go. So we have those. 
And what we want to do now is, well, okay, so we want to describe position as it changes and as time changes. And what does that get us? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, invent a little bit of data here uh, to work with. Let's imagine that um, we have um, position in feet in my classroom um, back at the high school. Uh, we have tiles that are uh, 12 inches by 12 inches. So we can use those as coordinate grid uh, in the room uh, for positioning. And I can set, select one of them to be you know, my origin and select a particular direction to be the positive x direction. And so let's imagine we've done that and that we're going to check position of something that's moving um, every four feet for a bit. And let's imagine uh, then that we've got a couple of different folks who are going to walk those 16 feet and we're going to time them as they go across. So I'll say we've got a, um, we have a fast Uh, our fast walkers time and our slow walkers time and you know they're starting off at zero seconds so we'll go ahead and we'll fill this out so I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend here uh, that we have uh, times for all of these folks. Um, and I'll make it fairly simple so it's easy to graph on the fly here. So we'll say that our fast walker gets here in one second and here in two and here in three and here in four. And our slow walker goes a little bit more slowly and uh, gets here in two seconds, here in four, here in six, here eight. Um, and so then we go ahead and we plot that on a graph. So I'm going to plot this on a graph. And I just made rough guesses for these. But we'll go ahead and we'll plot the, um, the, the times for our fast walker first. And we take a look and we have one there. And at four feet, they're at one second. And at eight feet, they're at two seconds. Uh, at 12 feet, they were at um, three seconds. And at 16 feet, they were at four seconds. And I draw. Hmm, that's a lousy line <laughs> for freehand. Um, and I'll draw a line through that and for my and label that fast. And our slow walker uh, has positions at four feet for two seconds, eight feet for four seconds. 12 feet for 6 seconds, 16 feet, 8 seconds, and their data looks like so. And so we take a look at these at this plot of data. Um, and incidentally, erase 
paste my data table here. Um, when we describe a graph like this, we say uh, and it's a position versus time graph. A, the first thing gets to be um, on the range axis, and the second thing is on the domain axis. So it's like if we were doing this um, and talking about mathematical functions, algebraic functions, it's like we're looking at it to see A as a function of B. And so here, uh, our, our lines here for our walkers, where we're looking at position versus time, we are looking to see what position they've arrived at as a function of their time. And we want to see, okay, well, what makes the fast one, there's a faster motion, different than the slow one? And we take a look at these, and we know the fast one's going to cover more distance in the same time as the slow one. Uh, or take less time to cover the same distance as the slow one. But the lines themselves, when we look at that, what that results in is that our fast walker has, got, has a steeper slope to that line than the slow walker does. Um, and so the slope is related to the fastness. And so we want to see, well, what is that slope? We remember from simple algebra what slope is. It's rise over run. So our rise gets to be the change in position. And the run gets to be the change in time. So the slope is the change in position compared to the change in time. It's the change in position with respect to time. Feet per second or we were using dist different distance measures, meters per second, miles per hour. What is this quantity? It's speed. Um, well, here's where we get a little different here. So if we are specific about the direction, we're going to call this velocity. Strictly speaking, this is average velocity. Um, here, this equation. Change of position over change in time. And let's see how that works out. So I'm going to write that V average equals change in position over change in time. OK. And that works, too, for constant velocity. So if we looked at the data we had before, we were doing like four feet per one second for our fast walker, eight feet per uh, four feet per uh, two seconds for a slow walker. So that's two feet per second. Um, and that was the same rate the whole time. The same average velocity was, it was a constant velocity. Um, so 
But, you know, real folks don't move like that, right? I mean, you don't start from dead zero and immediately go, you know, your car doesn't go zero to 60 in zero seconds. It has to change. So what if we had a graph of position versus time? It's supposed to be a T, make that look more like a T and not a E. And the graph looked more like that. Maybe it was always Kirby. Well, if I want to know, okay, well, what's my velocity right there? But it's got a curve to it. Well, okay, I mean, I, like, I can't, like, pick this spot and this spot and find the slope of that. That's going to be a different, it's like, that's the average velocity across that whole time. So I'd have to like look like really close to it maybe and say, okay, I zoom in and looked at this. Um, and over here um, at those points, well, it's still not a straight line at that point. And if this is really, if it's continuously changing and it's not jumping like from step to step to step, and nothing really that's not funky quantum mechanics jumps from step to step to step, um, then it's going to be always gradually changing. You have to keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, okay. So what we really want is we really want to say the instantaneous velocity, um, which we usually just don't put any subscript by. This is our slope of a position versus time curve at a specific point. How do you determine that? Well, if we did this and we made these steps smaller and smaller, that slope would be getting closer and closer to the slope at the single point. So we kind of represent this. We can thank Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz for this little notation here. We can say that it's equal to uh, d lower. We change the deltas into lowercase d's. That means that it's the slope at that point, that it's an infinitesimal change in position divided by an infinitesimal change in time. Like you can't really divide zero by zero, but this is like, you know, as you're getting super, what it looks like when you get cl closer and closer to zero, what the trend looks like when you're getting closer and closer to zero in the top and the bottom is what that represents. Now, in um, our intro classes at the high school where I teach, uh, we're using algebra for our mathematics, but this is notation that goes along with differential calculus. And so that notation is still used uh, for that. There's a new, there's a different type of math that is used when you have things that are more curvy. But in my intro classes, we just use, uh, we just find slopes of straight lines, like with rectangles and triangles and trapezoids, fun stuff like that. Um, and I think it's best to stop here before moving on to the next topic.